Hi everybody and welcome to part three. Now in part one and two we discussed the what and the how. What is color psychology and how does it work, so to speak? Or at least in my perspective, how does it work? In this one I want to describe the why. I want us to discuss the why and how it's used in society, how it's used in advertising to actually influence us in a certain way. Okay? And the first example that we have here is one that I love. An absolutely awesome example. Oprah Winfrey, and her, furthermore, her magazine, Oprah Winfrey Magazine. And as we, ex as we start to analyze it, you're probably, with your newfound knowledge, already starting to make connections between the psychology and the color that she chose to use. But furthermore, I want to draw your eye to certain important design elements of it. For instance, body language. Okay? Look at her pose. Look at her facial expression. Look at the O. That's a very important design element in all of her magazines, and we're going to discuss that briefly. Okay? But if we browse through it, her, generally speaking, when we look at her facial expression, we generally make a connection directly between her facial expression and the colors being used in that scene to further enhance the emotion involved. If we look at this image, for instance, here, I'm going to sample a quick color here. Look at her pose. Diagonal pose. Her shoulders are diagonal. They're not straight. Look at her mouth. Okay? Her mouth is open. She's caught laughing. It's a very relaxed pose. Even her pre the way her chest is jutted forward almost suggests that she's in the she was caught laughing. If we look at this one, which is almost identical, these two, the first and the third, are almost identical. However, look at a very important difference in the design: horizontal shoulders, vertical body, power. Okay, it's not so much an energetic pose; it's a powerful pose. Look at her smile. Her mouth is closed. She's not laughing. She's smiling, but her gaze is very straight. Look at the colors being used. Okay, let's start to analyze the difference in colors between these two. Look at this. First one, a joyful picture. She's laughing, she's relaxed. Look at the colors. Joyful, natural colors. Green yellows. The background, a silver color, which I haven't discussed yet, but very often the color gray, depending on its context, can be associated with elegance, humility, respect, stability, and wisdom, which are all words that we connect with Oprah Winfrey, right? So we have very natural. Here there's more yellow. And is it any wonder that she's got a very playful, youthful look on her face? She's hiding behind a book like a little girl, right? It's a very playful image. However, look at a very common theme we have here. Red, 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 red. Everywhere you look, you get red, right? Red, think about that in terms of royalty. A dark, rich red, a color of power. Look at this gold in this picture, a color of wealth and power as well. Wealth equals power plus joy. A lot of joy that comes with wealth. Power. Color of gold. Okay? Here. Power, but flirtatious. There's pinks, but there's a, a hot pink. It's not a soft, it's a maternal color. But then there's also this purple, a playful purple. But the purple is a royal purple. She's stating flirtatiousness and sexuality, but she's also suggesting authority at the same time. And the last design element is, look at her head in position with the O lined up perfectly. The top of the O, her head. Top of the O, head. Top of the O, head. Etc. And so on and so forth, minus a few little exceptions. But 99% of the time this is what you're going to see. Even when she's on a bike, her head is lined up with the O. And the only exception is this one. Who's, color who's donning the color of power? Obama. Michelle Obama, the First Lady. Which color is complementary to the O? The red, which draws your eye to a point of visual tension the complementary colors. Look at her head in relation to the O. Obama's is up here, lined up with the O, and Oprah's is way down low. Look at Oprah's pose. It could be she's relaxed and saying, oh, that's very interesting, or applauding something that she's saying. But in fact, she's not. If you look at it, it's very much a pose of prayer, of humility. She's humble next to Obama, the more powerful lady. Oprah might be the, one of the most powerful women on earth, but Obama is definitely more powerful. And that message is very clearly being told. Even look at the circle on the top right over her head. And if you think of that in reference to her pose, how she's actually, it actually looks like a halo over her head. That's absolutely no mistake. Her color is purple, but compare the purple. We've got power purple, and we've got youthful, innocent, soft purple a very big difference emotionally as far as the message is concerned. There isn't a single element in this entire scene that wasn't thought out entirely. Okay? And if we move on and we actually start to look at films, for instance, look at The Incredibles. As we know The Incredibles, colors of power and energy, yellows, oranges, and reds. If, for instance, we go and de delve into one of these scenes where he's not so powerful, he actually there's a slight sense of defeat and depression because he was captured by the bad guy, Syndrome. 
Look at the saturation of blue in the entire scene and how it softens and depresses everything. Look at this scene when he's forced to live a regular commoner's lifestyle as an insurance salesman when he knows he can lift buildings and throw cars like frisbees, right? Desaturated blues and greens, cold colors, the life has been sucked out of there. Okay, nothing exciting, no di nothing dynamic like the strong contrast between the black and the red. Here, very low contrast between light and shadow. It's boring, it's lifeless, it's dull. And if we think, if we go even further, look at the scene at the end when Jack Jack actually starts, actually gets kidnapped by Syndrome, or at least he attempts to, right? Sorry, spoiler, right? But Pixar, the producers of this film, wanted to put you in the headspace of fearing losing a baby, and when Syndrome takes him, you want to actually feel the emotional impact of the scene. Therefore, the whole sky is full of pinks and blues, colors of maternity and paternity. If you used colors of anxiety and, and aggression, red and yellows and oranges, for instance, at least in this context, it's creating an emotional friction, but when you actually put yourself in the headspace of a parent, it's far more frightening to see your children being pulled away from you. Right? That being said, let's see how Pixar uses maternity in different contexts. Up, the scene where the, the two lovers, the two young lovers, are talking about having a baby together. Look at the colors. Pink dress, soft baby pinks, high value, everything's well lit. Even the shadows are soft, it's not a high contrast. Baby blue, yellow, pink skin, peaches, everywhere you look. It's putting you in the headspace of babies because she's seeing babies in the clouds. Look at partly cloudy babies. Pink and blue. It's a story about the clouds that make babies that the storks take down to earth, bring them to their mothers and fathers. However, this cloud in particular makes the dangerous ones. He doesn't make the puppies and the kittens and the baby girls and baby boys. He makes the alligators, porcupines, and electric eels. And this poor bird who has to transport them ends up having an anxiety problem. Well, look at the colors. We have maternity and paternity. We even have the peaches, very often associated with babies as well. But he's a bit down on his luck. He's a bit jealous of the other clouds. So he's a very dark, desaturated, blue, depressed storm cloud color. Where him, he's also donning the colors of, of blue, of softness, but there's a slight touch of red. It's a slightly purplish blue, isn't it? Which is the anxiety associated with his personality when he has to transport an electric eel. Okay? He gets quite injured quite often. Let's look at children's programming. How are they lit? How are they colored? Everything is extremely clear, bright saturation. We are not hiding any in, in information, therefore making it a very innocent scene. The high value and the high presence of light makes it something very easy on the eyes, very easy to understand. The only exception is when we look at Polka Dot Door, which a lot of you are laughing at right now. When I heard Pokeroo as a kid, I used to drop everything and run to the living room. This is actually taken in a natural outdoor uh, environment rather than a set or a CG environment. There's a slight presence of natural shadows in here, and although it's brightly lit, we can see, if we compare them, that this almost feels a little bit off in terms of a child's image. It's not entirely off, but you can sense, there's a slight sense of tension in here with the, with the contrast. And then, of course, there's some people that just don't get it at all. Moving on, let's look at horror movies, the opposite spectrum of innocence. It's where people where are films that are made to intentionally scare people. If we look at the old magazine covers, full of red! full of intense reds, the association with, with uh, blood and pain, right? However, by today's standards, it's not very scary. The further we progress through, through Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, Amityville, Shudder, Silent Hill, so on and so forth, and then we get into today's, okay, Blair Witch Project and Paranormal, ac a par paranormal Activity, sorry about that, there's almost no presence of red. In fact, the colors aren't aggressive in red at all. They're actually quite desaturated and depressing, aren't they? There's sadness involved there. There's depression. The depression that is associated with death, the fear of death. There's also a high use of shadow. If I actually, you can see the border for this Blair Witch Project. You can only see right in front of your face, but what if you saw the reflection of two little eyeballs that were caught in the background, probably probably make you pee your pants, wouldn't it? And in this, anytime there's anything scary happening, it's always happening in an area where it's very poorly lit. This hallway and this shadow be behind the door are the most frightening things in the world. Even though you're not looking at anything, it's the fear of the unknown that makes it frightening. And that's what separates today's horror movies from the olden days. That's what makes them more frightening. Let's look at how color can be used to manipulate us. McDonald's, this is their logo. It's food, supposedly. That's the suggestion of it. And what are the colors of hunger? 
red, and yellow. However, have they given us yellow? Have they given us orange? No. They've juxtaposed red and yellow, the two most intense emotions associated with food, but they're not giving us food. They're giving us the most intense color of survival and the most intense color of joy. And if we've ever seen Super, Super Size Me, the documentary, a guy who tried to live off of a two-month McDonald's-only diet, he essentially started to show signs of chemical addiction, extreme highs and extreme lows, which is exactly what we're seeing in this logo. Okay, they're, they're presenting to us in emotional intensity associated with food, but we know that it's not actually food. And if we look at these other examples, we can see, if we look up here, red and the cheese is always sticking out. A little bit of cheese sticking out, cheese sticking out. That's our yellow, that's our joy against intense need to survive. And the only example of the Big Mac you're going to find where you don't have that strong presence of red is this one. What we've lost with red, we've made up with the expression on a man's face that looks like he's going to hit you in the face with a shovel, right? When in fact we know that this is what it really looks like in real life. But the mind's eye is far more powerful, generally speaking. I'd like to close up on this, and that is to show you how we have over the years desensitized ourselves to the power of color and its subtle uses. And these are paintings, three paintings done by the Dutch Flemish painter William Bouguereau. In this, a painting of joy, of love, a young girl visited by Cupid. In this, a girl relaxing, a sheep herder, leading on her stick, posing for a picture. And in this one, it's two demons duking it out, clawing at each other in, in hell. Okay? Look at the subtle uses of color the saturation of yellow to evoke the color of joy, the pinky peaches to evoke the color, the feeling of maternity, the reds, the red color of passion, the natural greens in the background, very highly saturated in yellow. William Bouguereau did not necessarily study color psychology, but in its most subtle uses he's captured a very beautiful and real feeling. He was a realist painter. Look at this one. Is she excited? Is she wearing a big red dress? Is she wearing makeup and eyeliner? No. Do you love this painting? Is it beautiful? Is it believable? Does it make you want to stare at it for hours? Absolutely yes. Because Bouguereau did not have a McDonald's at every, at every street corner. Bouguereau had real life. And Bouguereau was very sensitive to the natural properties of life, the same way you are just as capable of doing if you look outside your window right now. Okay? It's the subtlety of emotion that is just as powerful as the intensity of it. And then, in his own imagination, because Bouguereau didn't study color psychology, in this theme where he has two demons clawing and tearing at each other in hell, he's incorporated colors of heat and anger, reds and oranges, the obscurity of bodies in the background that you can't see, the lack of information, the fear of the unknown. He didn't have industrial light and magic doing special effects for him. He did this with a paintbrush and a, a paintbrush and a canvas. Okay? That being said, I'm going to close up at 13 minutes because these videos have to be tight and short. I hopefully, as an artist, this is opening you up to the specifics of color and the emotional qualities, the emotional power of color. And it will give you the power to be able to choose specifically the emotional impacts that you're aiming for with your audience, to connect with yourself and with your audience emotionally when it comes to your work. And furthermore, as a person, I hope it's giving you the opportunity to walk outside your house and actually see the world for the first time, if you haven't already. If you're cold and bored and lonely, ask yourself why. Don't just suffer it. Live it. Engage with it. Okay? Engage yourself in your environment. If you're making color choices with your clothes, ask yourself why. Are you trying to share information with people or hide information from them with the way you dress? That being said, I hope you enjoyed. I've got tons of projects coming up, so we're going to have more tutorials coming up soon. Remember to subscribe. And if you want access to any of my videos as well, you can also go to www.adamationstation.com. Thank you for listening. Take care.